Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Government Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I would like to welcome you to our event on the future of artificial intelligence. AI is being deployed in many areas from healthcare and education to retail and transportation. It's being used to take over repetitive, boring, or dangerous tasks, and the goal is to reduce costs while still providing high quality services. John Allen and I have a Brookings book entitled Turning Point, Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. And we wrote this book because we think AI is the transformative technology of our time. Uh, we present in-depth case studies of AI in a variety of different areas and talk about how it's being used as well as the risks that are being created. There are many different problems of AI in terms of fairness, bias, lack of transparency, uh, the impact on human safety, and then there are interesting governance questions just in terms of who decides, like who should uh, really guide the future development of AI. And we use the title of turning point because we argue the world is at a crucial turning point between utopia and dystopia, and that the crucial variable in determining the future is public policy. So we present a detailed policy and governance blueprint and argue that if we take appropriate actions, we're very confident about the future, but if we don't do certain things, uh, the world could go off the rails uh, pretty quickly. So to help us think about the issues associated with artificial intelligence, we have two distinguished experts. Rebecca Wexler is an assistant professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley Law School. Uh, she also is a non-resident senior fellow in our governance studies uh, program, and she writes, about the intersection of law and technology. Bashkir Chakravorty is the Dean of Global Business at the Tufts University Fletcher School of Global Affairs. He's also a non-resident senior fellow in our Governance Studies program, and he writes about the international aspects of uh, technology, and he has an interesting forthcoming report on the state of innovation in 90 nations around the world. So our format will be, uh, I'm going to start with a few questions uh, for our uh, two uh, panelists, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. Uh, those of you who have questions, uh, you can email them to us uh, at events at brookings.edu. That's events at brookings.edu. Or uh, we have uh, set up a Twitter hashtag AI governance, uh, and you can uh, send questions uh, that way as well. So I'd like to start with uh, Rebecca. Uh, so AI is being used in a lot of different areas. Uh, perhaps one of the more problematic applications uh, involves AI in the criminal justice system. And you're a law professor, so you focus a lot on uh, the intersection of law and uh, technology. How is AI uh, poised to affect due process in the U.S. criminal justice system? Well, Daryl, thank you so much. I want to just start by th saying thank you for having me. And I have your book, Turning Point, down in the living room. I should have brought it with me for this, but I see it in, on your bookshelf there, and it's just an, an excellent book. I've learned so much from it. So AI is being used throughout the criminal justice system, as Daryl said, at all stages, from policing, investigations, and then analyzing evidence for use at trial, uh, sentencing, parole, all of these decisions. And I think, that we have three big questions to ask about it. One is access. Who has access to the data that you need to train AI systems? Who has access to the data that you need to deploy AI systems? The second big question is markets. Who is paying for the development of these tools? And how do their interests get enhanced by the efficiency capacities that Daryl's talking about for AI systems? Who's not paying for the tools? And what interests might be being left out of the design of these systems? And the third big question is oversight. So who should decide what Daryl's saying? Do we want an FDA for AI? Do we need expert audits who are independent of the developers? Do we want ex post contestability with rights to explanation. So in terms of the criminal justice system specifically, I think one of the big challenges for society is gonna be, we have a criminal justice system that is tainted 
by structural, express, and implicit racism. And are AI tools going to increase those disparities or can they help us to mitigate them? I'll just start with an example on the access front. Um, who is going to be able to get access to data to use the tools that we're developing? If we have AI assisted DNA analysis, for instance, is law enforcement going to be the only one who can run the system on a DNA database? Or are we going to have the criminally accused able to run that system to provide an alternate theory of the case, look for alternate suspects if it's a mistaken ID, uh, use a different system that might have different thresholds or different design optimality to have an alternate result. What's happening with AI and one of the big risks I wanna uh, tee up to talk about is that sometimes laws that aren't explicitly about regulating these systems like information privacy laws can have unintended consequences of exacerbating these disparities and who's going to be able to benefit from the systems. So for example, well-meaning information privacy laws can sometimes create these disparities by having exceptions that give law enforcement access to sensitive information, whether it's face matching databases, DNA databases, uh, the contents of your emails, anything, very sensitive information. But we give law enforcement access to that and we often don't include parallel exceptions to permit the criminally accused to access the same kind of evidence. So those types of structural disparities are going to become much worse as AI enhance efficiency and, and power. Oh, those are all uh, great points, and we're going to uh, come back to those in uh, just a minute. I want to bring in uh, Bashkar. I mean, you write a lot about the international aspects of uh, tech policy, so uh, many of the problems that people worry about in terms of privacy, safety, uh, lack of transparency, racial bias, and so on, is not just a US problem, but many countries around the world are uh, trying to deal with these uh, issues. Countries are thinking about innovation, competition policy, privacy, security, trade, and uh, a number of other aspects of uh, AI. Uh, so I'm just curious, how would you describe the approaches that are under consideration in other countries? Uh, what are they doing? Uh, are they kind of paralleling approaches that are common here in the US? Are they following a different course of action? Uh, what can we learn from looking outside the United States? Thank you, Daryl, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, fantastic conversation. It's great to have uh, an opportunity to uh, engage in this discussion uh, with you and with Rebecca and to learn from both of you and uh, 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 get into a discussion with our, our audience here on a topic that I'm sure, you know, each one of us has been kind of been saturated uh, with information about. And, uh, and still, we feel there's so little uh, we quite un we understand about this evolving space. And of course, uh, at the beginning of this year, we thought we were sort of confused with all the different uh, stimuli and information about AI, that AI was going to be like electricity running through uh, everything we do. Uh, and, and, and of course, there were all the talk about how uh, the AI, uh, a, a superpower race is, uh, is, is picking up, uh, you know, prior to 2020, there was a lot of concern about the US-China uh, bipolarity in terms of approaches to AI. And this is where I'm uh, getting into a response to your question, Daryl. Uh, uh, so there were so many issues that we were trying to wrap our arms around as we entered 2020 and then boom, we, were hit by the pandemic. And one of the critical things about AI, and not to oversimplify something that is an enormously complex topic, of course, is that it depends on an analysis of the past in order to make predictions about the future. And then what happens is you get hit by this continuity and the whole notion of the past itself not necessarily gets thrown out the window, uh, but then you have to start redefining the assumptions and retraining all your formulae and algorithms. And uh, what I have found interesting and my team has found interesting is over the course of this year, how have countries around the world 
responded to this discontinuity? And what is it telling us about their potential approaches to both innovation and uh, uh, to uh, innovation and regulation and to the different kinds of applications that we might take uh, this uh, emerging technology towards. And we're, what we are seeing is you know, quite a diversity, as you can imagine, of approaches. On the one hand, you have the United States, which uh, traditionally had been uh, the, 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 the home of permissionless innovation uh, with very minimal uh, uh, you know, management of uh, the, uh, the creative process. And, uh, and you just kind of let them, uh, you know, let, let the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, uh, go at it. And of course, uh, the market system kind of determined which applications got uh, uh, more attention. So we saw uh, the banking sector, the retail sector, uh, uh, military applications, uh, telecom and tech, you know, a lot of AI applications are already getting embedded in those industries. And a lot of that is being driven by uh, of firms in the United States leading the way, and then those applications uh, spreading globally. So it's not just a US phenomenon, it's, it's happening all over the world. It's happening not just across the OECD countries, but it's happening in the developed world, uh, developing world as well. So we, we are seeing those applications all over the place, and it's largely an outcome of business models. So essentially, the introduction of AI, as Daryl, you mentioned, a lot of quote unquote repetitive tasks you know, uh, uh, can be embedded into algorithms and that could help improve efficiencies, lower costs, and you could potentially uh, elevate your product by adding a certain amount of differentiation to it. Most of it has been a cost uh, 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 and efficiency uh, driven, driven move. And we've seen that spread across the world. We've seen that uh, not just uh, in, in, in uh, Western Europe and North America, we've seen that in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, in uh, bank, banks, for instance, uh, you know, being, uh, using such uh, uh, algorithms. On the other hand, uh, as we think about uh, the applications of uh, AI uh, to predicting uh, what is around the corner across different industries, suddenly the, the notion of how we deal with healthcare and public health has uh, come to this, you know, come to the forefront. And the discontinuity that uh, we were hit with has translated into a different ways in which countries around the world have, uh, uh, have responded to the enormous amount of data uh, that is now accumulating in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the state of uh, the uh, infection of, uh, uh, of, of the population. And uh, here, uh, I'd just like to make a point that uh, COVID is of course a public health crisis, it's an economic crisis, uh, it's a humanitarian crisis, it's also an information crisis. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, what the state of the disease is. I don't know whether I have it or not this very moment. None of us knows whether the last person we met have it at, at that moment. And each country around the world has taken a somewhat different approach to how it collects that information from people and potentially processes it in order to make a better decision. So you see uh, many countries in Asia, for instance, taking a much more of a, a, a top-down view uh, towards collecting that data and uh, then harnessing it for decision-making purposes. But that top-down approach at one point level is, has been taken to the extreme in China, uh, where a lot of the data has been centralized and that has been used to then spread decision-making uh, across the community. Uh, Singapore to a, a lesser extent. And then you see countries like South Korea and Taiwan uh, that are essentially taking a top-down approach, but with the permission of the citizens. And, Here's where it becomes really interesting that this year has taught us a lot about how one harnesses all this data through uh, a top-down and a bottom-up collaboration. Uh, and a lot of uh, the permission to do that comes from a culture and history. So when we think about the role of AI, the future of AI, we also have to embed it in the larger global and local socioeconomic and sociocultural and historical context. So there's a lot of learning that we are, uh, that we are getting uh, just by observing how countries around the world are responding to this information crisis that we are living through and the effectiveness with which they are harnessing this data to make better decisions. It turns out most of the Western countries are doing an awful job of, uh, of harnessing this data. And a large part of that is because they have concerns about privacy and, uh, uh, and they're struggling 
uh, to uh, uh, figure out whether the data should be centralized or it should be embedded in, in, in users' phones. And that uh, uh, confusion has essentially meant that not just the United States, but the European countries themselves are struggling to figure out uh, you know, how to uh, take all this information and translate that into better decisions. Now, I focus on 2020 because it's a gigantic science experiment, it's a gigantic learning moment for us as we reflect on how do we respond to uh, this discontinuity and in real time try and come up with algorithms uh, to solve problems. And this will teach us something about where we go from here. So I've gone on for a long time, but I just wanted to also make a comment about some differential applications of AI in different parts of the world uh, that might be interesting to get into in a later point of this discussion, which is I talked about the banking sector, for instance, as one of the early adopters of AI. And of course, banking is a global phenomenon and uh, it's uh, uh, the algorithms are used uh, in, in banks all over the world, but there are other applications uh, where you might see certain parts of the world benefit from the adoption of better data and analytics and uh, uh, AI. Uh, and uh, we are so far not getting enough traction among companies and adopters uh, in, in that regard. And let me just give you one example. And that's the example of agriculture. So a large part of the developing world is heavily agriculture dependent and much of the agriculture is uh, sub-optimized in terms of productivity and efficiency. The introduction of better decision tools using data analytics and AI through uh, a, 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 a better agricultural practices and precision agriculture could enormously improve the productivity of the agricultural sector of many developing world nations. And I think there is an opportunity here. Um, my team has done some analysis of how much this could be worth. It's about uh, 195 to $200 billion worth of value can be unlocked simply by applying AI to precision agriculture in many parts of the developing world, particularly in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I can go into more details on that, uh, but I think uh, the application of AI and what we are learning about uh, its future potential a lot of that is, uh, uh, is, is quite different depending on whether you are in the developing world, whether you're in the emerging world, or whether you're in the OECD world. Those are interesting divergences just in terms of how various countries are thinking about these issues. And uh, I agree with your uh, basic point in terms of the United States has tended in the past to be pretty libertarian in its stance on uh, technology. You mentioned uh, permissionless innovation being the dominant uh, theme uh, that has read through uh, our approach to uh, technology over the last uh, few decades. Uh, but I think the United States is starting to change because uh, we have seen an emerging tech lash, uh, kind of a backlash against the tech sector, people's growing concerns about privacy, racial bias, uh, cybersecurity uh, threats, and so on. So I think even in the United States, we're starting to move towards greater public engagement, uh, more uh, oversight, and possibly uh, more uh, regulation. So Rebecca, I wanna come back to you. I mean, your opening comments, you mentioned some of these problematic disparities between prosecutors and defendants, just in terms of the kind of access to information uh, they have, uh, the data access. Uh, you mentioned some of the privacy uh, rules, which were adopted for completely noble reasons to protect all of our privacies. But as you mentioned, uh, some of the laws uh, provide special exemptions for law enforcement and uh, you know, you express some concern about whether that tilts uh, the uh, criminal justice uh, system away from uh, defendants. Of course, the issue of racial bias is a huge uh, problem uh, throughout the uh, criminal justice system. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you see uh, these kind of problems playing out in the criminal justice system. Uh, are there specific things that are worrying you, specific examples, uh, and how we can address some of those problems? Thank you. Yeah, so I do think that these are reflections of broader systemic power disparities between the government and the criminally accused. And uh, just to also build off of what Bhaskar is saying, some of it has to do with what type of oversight we have over private innovators versus what type of oversight we have government technology. So just to, to little put a little check mark in there, um, Daryl, the problem is pervasive that prosecutors have more access, more power, more resources, more money, more time. At the state level, prosecutors are often paid more than public criminal defendants. They have a lower caseload. 
even though they're both serving the public interest, we have an adversarial justice system that relies supposedly on both prosecutors and defense counsel to seek just outcomes. Um, and yet we see these power and resources disparities up and down the entire system. So um, a very concrete example of a privacy law that I've been very worried about that has a disparity built into it is the Stored Communications Act. And this is a key internet privacy law that was passed in 1986, but is still our main internet privacy law in the US. And it permits law enforcement to go get data from tech companies, but doesn't allow criminal defense investigators to get the same data from the same sources. And so one of the things I've been working on is trying to encourage courts to adopt a better interpretation of the statute that would build in parity and also to encourage lawmakers and policymakers as we're thinking about how to set new privacy policy, all very well intentioned, to realize that law has well established lobbying power. So they're there at the table and there are fewer people who are able to represent the interests of the criminally accused in the lawmaking process. Um, to loop in what some of what Bhaskar is saying about the how are we as a society prioritizing top-down innovation, government control versus um, bottom-up, some of the regulatory proposals for different AI applications, whether it's uh, AI systems that will help you sort through large swaths of data, whether it's uh, uh, who's going to be able to use face recognition systems, uh, whether it's, you know, who has control and possession of your DNA and who gets to access that. Some of the regulatory proposals are also targeted to law enforcement use without attending to the possibility that law enforcement then circumvents the regulation by buying the same data off the private market. So there's two ways that this can lead to circumvention. One is, oh, I'm not allowed to use this technology. Well, thank you market, I'll just purchase it. The other is, well, hmm, I'm the prosecutor, I'm law enforcement, the government not trying to tag any individuals here, but um, the government overall, the prosecution's interest is in finding evidence of guilt. Their interest isn't in finding evidence of innocence. And in fact, they have no constitutional, statutory, or ethical duty to seek out evidence of innocence. So now consider, Daryl, you opened with a question about due process. Consider what due process requirements do we impose on prosecutors and law enforcement, police officers, when they use AI systems? Do they have to disclose information about subjective choices that are set when an analyst applies the system, the thresholds that are set, the way we prepared a probe photo in a uh, face recognition system, the um, um, scope of validation study for the, for the uh, system, the source code for the system, the training algorithm, the underlying training data, how much of that do we have to disclose? Daryl mentioned transparency. Now ask yourself, well, if I'm purchasing this system off the private, market, could I just not acquire that information? Could I just license the results? And if I don't have possession of it as law enforcement, do I now no longer have a disclosure obligation? So all of these uh, questions about structural disparities as well as private versus public uh, you know, ownership and uh, how much democratic control we have in different contexts are, are really um, ripe for policymakers to weigh in. Oh, thank you for uh, pointing out those uh, examples. Certainly uh, lots to uh, worry about there. So uh, Bhaskar, I know you have a, a new report coming out uh, soon on the state of innovation in 90 different countries. And I think you look at something like 160 different indicators. So obviously it's very ambitious and very uh, comprehensive. And just wondering if you could give us a quick preview of uh, some of the important findings. Sure, absolutely, uh, uh, Daryl. So we are uh, uh, just about to launch on uh, December 1st, actually, uh, the, the latest, the 2020 edition of the Digital Evolution and Trust 
uh, studies that we do every two years. Uh, so this year we are looking uh, at uh, 90 countries, as you mentioned, and it is a special year because uh, uh, this is a year when uh, much of the world has relied on these technologies to keep some semblance of uh, economic and social and other activities going. So it is particularly meaningful for us as we try and understand how countries are uh, are evolving from a digital past to a, a uh, I'm sorry, a physical past to a digital future, and particularly in a year when that journey has been accelerated uh, by the lockdowns and shelter at home and social distancing uh, over the course of the last ten months. So what we are seeing is uh, you know some some interesting uh, phenomena. One is uh, that countries in Asia, for instance. Uh, are uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, you know, and, and not, not surprisingly, are leading the pack in terms of being ahead on uh, the actual, their, their, their state of evolution, as in how much of their activities have they uh, put on the digital uh, systems and uh, uh, how much they, uh, in, in many ways, how trustworthy are the environments uh, uh, within which uh, activity takes place. And, uh, and, and then we've uh, had an opportunity to look at kind of different parts of Asia, you know, such as uh, countries like Singapore, uh, which are standouts in uh, kind of all regards, both in terms of the state of evolution, uh, but also the momentum of change. So Singapore continues to move quite rapidly. An interesting uh, uh, alternative to Singapore is a country like China, which still has a lot of unrealized potential in terms of evolution, despite the fact that so much of China has moved to digital platforms and had done that way before uh, 2020, uh, China is a vast complex uh, country and a vast complex society. So the uh, benefits of the digital ecosystem has not fully penetrated uh, uh, this, this uh, very large country. However, what China has excelled in is momentum. The pace of change of China is just incredible. It is just mind boggling just to see uh, the change that has happened in China. Now I reflect on uh, how that has played out in terms of China's management on the sort of bringing us back to the topic that we were mentioning before, which is how has China managed to utilize these di digital ecosystems in order to, uh, uh, to control uh, the spread of COVID and to control the pandemic and get its economy uh, back into uh, motion. And I think it's been pretty impressive. Uh, uh, and a large part of that has been uh, an outcome of uh, the centrally controlled systems uh, that govern uh, the, uh, the use of data and the application of data and the fact that so much of the Chinese population is on a few apps. And those few apps uh, 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 kind of help combine multiple forms of activity and thereby enrich the quality of the data uh, which then are used to train the algorithms. And those algorithms invariably are going to be better uh, in terms of the, the, the predictions they provide because you have multiple activities that are combined on, on the same platforms. And then all the data then gets centralized in one place. So I think China is giving us a model for uh, one form of societal structure organized digitally as we are coming through uh, this period. And uh, then there's the alternative model, which is the, uh, the European model. Uh, and uh, we, what we are seeing in uh, our, our, our latest study is the European countries uh, have reached a very high level of maturity, uh, but they have slowed down in terms of momentum, in terms of change. And part of that is a natural outcome of just age. So they're uh, you know, essentially what I call digital arthritis has set in in many parts of Europe because they, uh, you know, they peaked very early. But simultaneously, Europe has been among the leaders in setting some guardrails in place and some policy uh, uh, constraints on uh, what you can do with data. And essentially, it is setting a standard for the world in terms of uh, uh, privacy management and data management. And that uh, sort of, put, to, to some extent, counters this notion of permissionless innovation from the bottom up or centralized innovation coordinated from the top down. So Europe is providing an alternative model. So digital arthritis is an outcome, not just of digital maturity, uh, but also digital rule setting in Europe. Now, I find it very interesting uh, sort of comparing uh, these different polls to a couple of other countries, Daryl, and then I'll shut up and we can continue the discussion. Uh, and I really uh, 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 found it interesting, uh, uh, the, the comments that Rebecca made about the, how the legal system sort of goes about it and the political economy 
uh, that's in place. You know, uh, the political economy is a great way to understand the incentives behind regulators and how lawmakers are going to make laws or not. And is it in my political interest to do this or that? Now, when you think about the United States, it's very interesting, Daryl, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, your observation that maybe the era of permissionless innovation in the United States is going to be tempered somewhat as we go into a new administration and a new reality of the tech lash and so on. Um, we've seen, of course, an enormous amount of pressure on big tech and enormous amount of almost bipartisan pressure on, 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 in uh, reining in uh, uh, the power of, of, of big technology companies. It'd be interesting to see as the Biden administration uh, sort of uh, you know, comes into place, how much of that energy will be continued in 2021? And we can only speculate. But I think part of the, uh, uh, the, the guiding factors here are going to be that the Biden administration has so many other priorities that they need to uh, focus on, whether it's uh, the COVID response or the economic response or climate change or racial inequalities, that I feel that technology uh, is going to take a bit of a backseat. So many of the issues that led into the election are going to take a bit of a pause. And then the rivalry with China in particular is going to start uh, you know, surfacing. And, and here I'm in speculation zone, whether uh, the, the, the success of the Chinese model, not just in terms of delivering digital momentum, but also delivering a world-class pandemic response is going to put pressure on the American policymakers to now come back and look at our own systems here and say, how do we compete with this juggernaut? So I think this is gonna set up a really interesting uh, 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 new dynamic as we go into 2021 and beyond. And I, I would be remiss in not mentioning one other model, which is kind of off to the side, but it's an interesting model to consider all the same. And it's not a model that has had great influence. In, uh, uh, in, on the global stage. And this is a model out of India. So if you think about the notion of uh, 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 what India has tried to uh, do is, you know, first of all, they put uh, a billion plus people on a single national ID system. And that in many ways creates a foundational infrastructure from which you could now, you know, utilize a, 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 a data management system, uh, which could lead to uh, a, a more inclusive approach uh, to, uh, uh, using data analytics and artificial intelligence for providing public services to a country uh, that for a large part of the country desperately needs many of these services. So I think there's a new model emerging in India, which could become a model if successfully deployed. Uh, 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 and with all the political economy concerns that Rebecca uh, was mentioning, they play out uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 times over in the developing world. Uh, so if there is a success model that comes out of India. I can see some of that penetrate into large parts of the developing world, certainly across uh, uh, Africa, uh, Latin America, and in many ways, it could actually also make its way into the United States because there are elements of what we are seeing in India in terms of the inclusion and the inclusionary model of data management uh, that could be quite appealing uh, to an American system. So I'll just pause there and uh, we can continue our discussion. Yes, no, those are all great points about the diverging models uh, around the world. And uh, your point about uh, tech lash in the United States, uh, I agree with. I actually wrote something for our Tech Tank uh, blog on what divided political control of Congress will mean if that is where we end up. So we have a Democratic House. Uh, the control of the Senate still depends on those two outstanding uh, Georgia races that will be decided on January 5th. But uh, if Republicans do retain control of the Senate, the implications for what a Biden presidency could do on technology policy in terms of antitrust uh, regulation, privacy protection, and other types of issues uh, could be quite substantial. And so a lot of the Democrats who are hoping to move very aggressively on tech regulation uh, may find uh, they can get things through the House. Uh, they may not be able to get uh, parallel legislation through the Senate. So uh, that is an important point uh, to watch. So, uh, Rebecca, uh, you have outlined a number of problems uh, uh, that we should uh, worry about. I'd like to move from problems to solutions. Uh, how do we address some of the uh, problems that you have identified? Are there possible remedies that would make a difference? Are there ways to reduce some of these disparities between prosecutors and defendants? Thank you. So then, well, this is the challenging. It's so much easier to talk about the problems than to figure out how to fix them. But, but okay, fine. I'll 
I'll give it a go. And, um, before I dive in, I just want to flag because Bhaskar has done such a great job bringing this to this cross-border, uh, transnational, the global perspective on this. And I want to say that there's also an issue for the U.S. criminal justice system around how different countries manage their data. So India has this new data localization laws that all around the world, people are passing data privacy, data protection, data localization. And what we're seeing at that transnational cross-border level is a mirror image of the political economy of law enforcement versus defendants within the US, where US law enforcement and law enforcement in other nations are negotiating to maintain cross-border data access despite these data privacy protection and localization laws. And once again, no one is negotiating for criminal defendants to get access to cross-border data. This gets more complicated transnationally, cross-border flows, because the US has an adversarial justice system where prosecutors, law enforcement, the government only has to get evidence of guilt. Whereas most of the countries they're negotiating treaties with for cross-border flows. In those countries, they have a more balanced investigative system, often what we call it a kind of inquisitorial system where government actors are actually responsible for finding both evidence of guilt and evidence of innocence. So I've spoken with some of the lawmakers in, in India who are negotiating, proposing these uh, data localization laws. I said, hey, did you realize that if you have exceptions for law enforcement, not for the defense, it's gonna be really hard you know, for criminal defendants access to evidence of innocence. The answer is it's not their problem. It's the US law enforcement's problem. It's the US executive branch that's negotiating this. And other countries don't, you know, they, they, that's not our system. We have our executive branch gets access. Our defendants are gonna have due process. You fix your problem over there. But um, it is a, uh, another problem, Daryl. <laughs> you have more problems. Now in terms of solutions, um, there are solutions for the, privacy side specifically, I have uh, two articles coming out that propose concrete solutions. For courts, I have um, an article called Privacy as Privilege coming in the Harvard Law Review that says, if a statute is silent on criminal defendants access rights, courts must construe it or interpret it to yield to the defense rights, that we shouldn't be presuming because of the political economy issues, we shouldn't be presuming that Congress intends to undo criminal defendants' rights with silence in a statute. So that's the instruction of, or guidance, the hope um, for how courts could solve this problem. There's a hope for lawmakers to solve this problem, which is say, hey, you know, we rely on defendants to investigate, just like we rely on law enforcement to investigate. So if law enforcement's coming to you asking for access to certain information with controls, safeguards, oversight, think about whether you should make that exception neutral. Say, we're not, nothing in this statute is meant to block otherwise valid and get investigative rights. And don't just say law enforcement's investigative, just say otherwise valid investigative rights. So we're not giving more access to defendants. We're not giving less access to defendants. Make it a parity, a symmetry. And of course, if you're very worried about the privacy concerns, you can always ratchet down. Nobody's gonna get access. Or you ratchet up, everybody's gonna get access. But make some requirement in there for it to be parallel access. Um, so that's one, one key um, um, solution for the privacy law part. But I started out and by just saying, I think there are these three big buckets of problems. Access to data to train to deploy systems, access or control over markets that determine how systems are designed, which systems get designed, for whom, and oversight. So on the solutions part, many of the oversight proposals for how to regulate AI in the criminal system and other parts of governance have to do with creating expert overseers, creating an FDA for AI, creating um, 
independent audit bodies. You know, um, Congressman Takano has this wonderful bill, um, the Justice and Forensic Algorithms Act, that um, um, proposes certain necessary standards for when we're gonna use AI and, and, and other algorithms in our criminal justice system. So we can have uh, bodies like NIST, um, you know, government uh, experts who can oversee an audit. And all of that's really important. I agree with all of it, but it's insufficient. And it's insufficient, we know, because we've relied on oversight regulatory approval bodies in our forensic evidence space for many years. And that has been a disaster failure. We have had a disaster of non-scientifically grounded forensic matching coming into our criminal system. This is your hair fiber analysis that the FBI had to uh, retract, your blood splatter evidence, your arson pattern matching evidence. Uh, no scientific basis for the kinds of claims that were coming in over and over and over again to say this defendant matches the crime scene evidence. Now we have forensic over regulatory bodies that are supposed to evaluate those systems and approve them and they haven't been enough to stop this poor quality evidence coming in. And so I wanna double down and say, in addition to oversight bodies, which are by definition made up of a limited number of humans, who have limited viewpoints because they're human. And in addition, um, they are subject to regulatory capture. They have uh, um, um, ex ante is the only option for them. They can only look at how the system works in a controlled condition. They can't look at how it works as applied in an individual case. They can't examine user error in the application of the system. Did we feed the thing right with the data we're supposed to be analyzing? Did we set the threshold correctly? Did you screw up something in how you uh, actually used the, the system or reported the results? So those kinds of problems require ex post or after the fact contestability. And we have to build that in to our oversight mechanism. It can't just be in advance oversight. You have to give individuals who are subject to AI decisions some process rights to scrutinize, to contest the results of the systems as applied in their case. Those are my proposals. Not Thank saying they're easy to achieve. Thank you. Uh, now those are uh, helpful and uh, very uh, forward looking. So we appreciate them. Uh, Basker, one more question for you, then we're going to move to uh, some questions from our uh, viewers. Uh, so you have pointed out uh, uh, the different approaches across a variety of countries in terms of how they are thinking about these types of issues. Since Biden was in the Obama administration, one of the ways that Obama dealt with these international conflicts, uh, international issues that were popping up across countries in the technology realm was through treaties and negotiations and different types of international agreements. So the question I have for you is when we're thinking about the upcoming Biden administration in relations with the European Union, India, China, developing nations, uh, and other countries around the world, how much do you think uh, Biden will emphasize trying to negotiate these differences either through outright treaties or just other types of agreements in the same way that Obama did? Or will there be other ways to try and resolve these kinds of international issues? Such an interesting question, Daryl. And of course, uh, you know, very, very timely. So, uh, and of course we are all reading the tea leaves you know, as we are going through this transition process. Uh, and uh, I, I, here's kind of my speculation. You know, Biden is the ultimate committee man. I mean, here's the guy who's been on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for decades. He's chaired the committee. More than Obama, he's going to be the internationalist. He, and he is, you know, he's def def definitively going to put behind the notion of America first and take uh, America part of a committee. And uh, of the many committees, of course, we know the Paris Accord, the WHO, and all of that. There is going to be some kind of a committee uh, process on um, uh, data, data governance, data management, and learning from each other. Now, here is where I think things could get a little messy, because as we all know, the committees are great. Uh, they are collaborative efforts. They uh, are a, a wonderful way to bring insights from many different dimensions on complex issues. The problem, of course, is that committees 
very rarely get things done in a timely manner. And there are obviously differences of objectives across the different stakeholders in these committees. A second challenge is that America's standing on the global stage has taken uh, you know, a few steps back. So we do need to repair some of that before uh, uh, Biden or whoever his representative is on those committees can actually pound the table and say, you know what, uh, you've got to listen to us. Uh, I think there is going to be an enormous pull, and I keep coming back to China, uh, for all the reasons that we understand. China was a major power for all kinds of reasons, and certainly uh, uh, the, the, the West and uh, much of the developing world uh, was backing away from the Chinese model of data governance and data management and data protection and the lack of access to uh, you know, data outside China. But the Chinese government now has a couple of uh, trump cards, trump cards uh, in uh, the lowercase t uh, <laughs> sense, which is that our model actually worked in 2020 in response to the biggest crisis of our lifetime. So you know what? Uh, we do have some leverage here. Uh, and I, I, I'm willing to bet that many parts, particularly of the developing world, are going to look at that model and say, hmm, let's take another look at some of the things that we, uh, uh, that, you know, uh, we always believed uh, we would uh, turn to the United States for. So I do believe that uh, there is going to be more of an internationalist posture as far as uh, 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 Joe Biden is concerned. Uh, but uh, he is going to join a table uh, where there are several other uh, uh, you know, people uh, and, and, and countries uh, with some, uh, some potentially uh, important uh, recommendations. I think uh, uh, the United States uh, would benefit uh, from absorbing uh, these different uh, uh, ideas and different principles and potentially integrating it. Because one of the great things about the United States is it is an integrative country. It absorbs ideas from all over the world and then makes something completely new out of it. And I think this is an opportunity. My concern right now is that all the signs that we've seen in terms of the Biden campaign is that they've not had a coherent tech policy. Uh, they have not had uh, any, any clear tech advisors. Every time uh, the question is popped uh, to, uh, to Joe Biden, he's given sort of a, a, a one-line response, which seems to suggest that this is an issue that is, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's sort of kicked a can down the road. So there is, there is some concern uh, that I have over that. I do believe that uh, uh, there are a few things that we need to sort out, and this could be done as part of this international uh, group that uh, America, I'm sure, will join uh, in 2021 and beyond which is getting clarity on what we mean when we say data. We automatically assume uh, that we all kind of understand what data is. Well, you know, it's not quite clear what data is because uh, uh, there are several things that we need to clarify in terms of what is data. We need to figure out what exactly constitutes personal data uh, on which one person has exclusive rights. For instance, you could be in a photograph uh, that has you know, all three of us on this picture. So who owns this image? And can I actually put this on Instagram? without Rebecca's permission, you know, we don't know about that. We need to establish criteria that demarcate personal data, anonymized data and third party data. When I'm using ways uh, and uh, to, to get directions uh, uh, in, uh, in a town, I'm utilizing my own data, the data of everybody else in, 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 in uh, cars around me, and then I'm using the Google algorithm. How do we separate these things? We have to create a transparent market-based universally accepted system of valuing data so that users can potentially be compensated for the data that they contribute to systems. We need to have systems uh, and standards about how data can be moved across platforms. So there's so many different issues that need to be resolved. And this resolution is not necessarily gonna come from Congress. It's not necessarily gonna come from the committees that uh, the international committees, uh, we would have to absorb these ideas from multiple sources. So I do believe that the Biden administration uh, is a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, administration. It is going to listen to all kinds of voices. But the issue is, I think it is going to slow down the process of getting to some decisions. That is going to take a long time. And, and just to answer your question on who owns the data on this broadcast, it's Brookings. But if you want to post anything on your Instagram account, we're happy uh, for you to uh, do that. So uh, no problem for Maria. Uh, let's uh, move to some uh, I'm not questions. taking any screenshots. <laughs> uh, let's move to uh, some questions from our audience members. There are a number of different uh, things that have uh, come up. So uh, one question concerns, what are the most interesting military and or national security AI applications that are being uh, developed? And 
That's an interesting uh, question. Uh, in our uh, Turning Point uh, book, uh, John Allen and I uh, have a uh, very long chapter on national defense and the AI application. J John, of course, is a uh, former retired uh, four-star uh, military uh, general, so has a lot of expertise in the military area. And some of the things that we talk about, uh, one is just data integration. And as uh, Basker has noted, data means a lot of different things. Data can be numeric and quantitative uh, data. It can be visual imagery. It can be satellite uh, imaging uh, information. It can be uh, video uh, types of uh, information. Uh, and so in the military area, obviously they wanna integrate information from a lot of different kinds of sources and then analyze it and be able to act on it as quickly as possible. Like that is where you gain a military advantage. So there's a lot uh, going on there. The Pentagon has set up a, a joint AI center to uh, aid in that uh, uh, integration uh, process. Uh, there's also uh, AI being applied in an area called predictive maintenance. Uh, we know one of the problems of any uh, army or uh, military is equipment breakdowns. The worst thing to happen is you're in the middle of the battlefield and your tank uh, breaks down. So the military has developed predictive analytics that uh, use sensors on uh, various types of military equipments and then use that information to predict when something uh, is likely to break down and fix it before it breaks down. So it's a way to basically improve uh, the equipment offerings and make sure uh, the equipment uh, is uh, there. Uh, and the last quick example, uh, which is just uh, an example I uh, discovered in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, featured drones uh, that would take pictures of the battlefield. Uh, and it was the Azerbaijanis who basically had the drone advantage on the battlefield. They would then use those pictures to take out uh, the tanks and the military equipment of the Armenians. And it's one of the reasons Azerbaijan was able to move to such an advantage and then were able to negotiate a, a, a terms that were very favorable to their side. So we certainly are seeing a lot of uh, military uh, applications there. Uh, Rebecca, a question for you concerns oversight bodies. So you uh, mentioned that we need to start taking a look at some of the AI problems that are developing. Uh, I mean, you have focused uh, mainly on criminal justice, but you know we see uh, uh, bias and fairness issues uh, that have popped up in a lot of uh, different areas. What would these oversight bodies look like and at what level should they take place? Should these oversight bodies be uh, at the local level, the state level, the national level? I mean, uh, what, what are your reflections on uh, those questions? Great. Uh, so I think oversight bodies should take place uh, all the way up and down. We should have you know, these proposals from um, Congress Nakano's bill would be to have standards that, you know, NIST has these, as an example, area committees that um, establish standards for the use of different forensic models. And I'm not saying that forensic models standards are uh, the only type of oversight. It's just that this is a model for us. We've, we've actually, we've had these oversight bodies of high technical systems up and down from the federal to local levels in forensics. And we can learn from our experience with those to say they're necessary, but not sufficient. So at the federal level, NIST has these area oversight uh, bodies. We've had two extremely important reports from the executive branch of the Obama administration. Um, um, uh, a PCAST report ex most recently exposing some of lack of scientific foundation in many of our forensic uh, methods. So the federal um, level can be very important. Um, then there's also state and local. So for instance, the uh, New York City um, uh, in New York State has a, a forensic regulatory commission that approves systems and they've approved uh, the use of certain software systems in forensics before for DNA analysis. The point I was making is that in addition to these oversight bodies, we also need the individuals who are affected to have rights to contest, to examine, to introduce alternate results from different systems, uh, for example, because another problem around political economy is that as it gets to be more expensive 
to train new systems for certain complex systems that require access to a large amount of data, large amount of computing resources to build, we're gonna get uh, fewer and fewer examples of those because fewer and fewer entities are gonna be able to create because they're so resource intensive to produce. Um, and so we, we don't want there to only be one system that gives us one answer to the problem. Are you guilty? Are you innocent? You know, if that were the case, I think we'd want a lot of oversight and a lot of individual transparency and scrutiny. But there's other ways that individuals can also contest. Um, you know, could you, could you um, um, have a requirement, for example, that um, an AI system that produces a result have variable thresholds and the individual who's affected by it gets to rerun the data that affect from their case through the system, but changing some of the threshold assumptions and how it was set. Do, do I want this system to return 50 uh, possible face matches or only the top 10? Or do I want it to return zero if there's none that I'm very confident in? Um, what happens if I program them with different assumptions about what kind of data is significant and what kind of data is noise? Would I get a, a different kind of a result? So what I'm saying is that while the oversight bodies matter a lot in terms of wanting independent validation studies, wanting, um, you know, um, uh, people outside of uh, a professional cohort to evaluate whether their methodology is actually scientifically grounded. Um, it's not enough because oversight bodies never know how the system is being used in the individual case. We need additional safeguards for individuals in their cases to be able to contest how the systems are used as applied is the legal jargon, but just means in your case after the fact. Do you know how it was used? Can you challenge it? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Bhaskar, we have a, a question for you about AI and global inequality. And the question is, do you, do you believe that AI will widen the economic inequality gap between developed and developing countries? And I would tack on just the additional, is it going to increase inequality even within the developing world? Like, will there still be winners and losers even among that group of nations? So my short answer to the question is yes and yes. Um, and uh, I'll elaborate on that in a moment, uh, but I, I also wanted to just add on to your uh, uh, excellent observations, uh, Daryl, on the security implications uh, of AI. I wanted to say that the, uh, what we should be looking for in addition to uh, the classic uh, use of data uh, for military responses, for sending tanks to a battlefield or dropping bombs in certain places, we should also be looking out for the applications of AI for non-traditional warfare, uh, whether that has to do with cyber warfare or uh, for uh, warfare that is uh, uh, that sort of infiltrates in different ways. So for instance, uh, there's been a lot of analysis done just to give you an example, a really scary example of what happened with the Rose Garden ceremony and who met whom uh, in, in, uh, by piecing together the photographs of the Rose Garden ceremony uh, 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 and, uh, and then eventually led to the infections across in the White House. Now that could create a blueprint for somebody who wanted to introduce a pathogen into uh, a, a high security uh, institution. So we, we should be looking out for multiple forms of applications of AI, not just in analyzing the data, but also in uh, planning uh, an attack. And that of course is an, un unfortunately a scary possibility. Uh, coming back to uh, you know, what I feel is gonna uh, be the outcome of AI as far as inequality is concerned, I do fear uh, that uh, uh, what we are likely to see is, and then this is draws from the basic notion of what AI is. You use the past as a way to, uh, uh, to turbocharge a bunch of decisions, uh, which then is uh, fed into uh, uh, you know, choices that are made in the future. And many of those decisions are some, are some of the more routine ones. So without the opportunity for human intervention, and uh, for an understanding of nuance and for an understanding of patterns and identifying you know, where uh, those who have historically uh, been excluded from opportunities or if there are historical biases in the past data, uh, these algorithms are likely to cement some of those biases and those exclusionary factors and uh, will uh, reinforce them and amplify them as we look ahead. Uh, and that's why I believe that it is going to exacerbate inequalities. Another reason why I fear it's going to exacerbate inequalities is because the algorithms themselves are expensive. 
And that money has to come from somewhere. Much of the money is gonna come from the private sector. Governments are gonna be focusing on a whole bunch of other things such as paying off debts uh, for the next uh, 10, 20 years. So when you turn to the private sector, they unfortunately or fortunately have some shareholders uh, that they need to serve. And in order to do that, you basically have to understand where the business models are. So my business model, if I'm a bank, involves recognizing a customer who walks in the door and simply by observing their face and their clothing, I reach a conclusion about their credit worthiness. And AI is gonna help me do that. Unfortunately, the face and the clothing uh, is based on some stereotypes that are uh, are, are driven by uh, what I've seen in the past. So if it is a white male who walks in relative to a black woman who walks in, the white male is like, likely to get a stronger score because historically they have been better customers of a bank. And that's just one example. It's a ridiculously stereotypical example, but I fear that this example permeates into all applications largely because that's what the business models are, are, are set up for. So. Yes and yes, that inequality across countries is likely to be exacerbated and inequalities within countries are likely to be exacerbated. Okay, uh, thank you for those points. This has been a, a tremendous conversation. I wanna thank Rebecca and Ambassador for your insights and Ambassador, we'll look forward to seeing your uh, international report that is uh, coming out in early uh, December. Uh, for those of you who would like uh, more information about uh, technology policy at Brookings, uh, please read our Tech Tank blog. We have uh, regular posts on uh, many different aspects of technology and policy, both in the United States as well as abroad. And uh, each of our panelists uh, contributes uh, to the blog. Uh, we also have a Tech Tank podcast uh, that we launched a few months ago. We've had a number of different episodes uh, air. Uh, you can access that uh, either through our uh, Tech Tank blog uh, or through Apple or uh, Spotify. Uh, our most recent episode was on technology policy in the next administration. Uh, I participated along with my colleagues, uh, Nicole Turner-Lee and Tom Wheeler, a very interesting uh, discussion about uh, what we should expect in terms of technology policy from the uh, Biden administration. So our panelists, thank you very much. Uh, our uh, audience, uh, we really appreciate your uh, tuning in. Thank you again. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.